the time of the crime, but that too had changed. Federico told the court, It's horrible. It's the worst feeling in the world knowing I did that, knowing I took so much from that family, so much from a mother. Kent County Prosecutor Chris Becker referred to Federico as a sociopath, saying he's irreparably corrupt. He said, What this man did to another human being is not a transient immaturity. This defendant, out of all juveniles and out of any juvenile, deserves a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Just as he had in 1997, Kent County Circuit Court Judge Dennis Lieber sentenced Federico Cruz to life without the possibility of parole on November 7, 2018. He stated that the savage butchery of his crime, along with his history of antisocial behavior and extensive juvenile record, excluded him from ever having the opportunity to leave prison. Judge Lieber continues to feel that Federico's outrageous behavior, both with regard to the murder and the mutilation, justified life, not years, in prison, stating that Federico Cruz experienced pleasure in what he did. He said it, and the video confirms it. He has a substantial personality disorder. Part 2 Matthew Borges Alex Berdier was 18 years old when she connected with her younger brother, 16-year-old Lee Manuel Valoria Paulino, in early 2016. The siblings lived just a few miles apart from each other in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and Alex considered their bond immediate. The pair shared a father who lived in the Dominican Republic and were part of a large extended family in the Boston area. She considered the connection she shared with her newfound brother to be the best she had ever made in her life. Lee was her best friend, and she truly felt she could be herself when she was with him. Alex considered her little big brother to be a great thinker who loved poetry. He also enjoyed stories that revolved around government deceit and corruption. Lee was a good kid, an intellectual kid who loved hugs. He babysat for his neighbor's children, and maybe was a bit too trusting and easily influenced by his peers, according to his mother. Lee's mom wanted to move her family back to the Dominican Republic because she felt that the Boston area was too dangerous a place to raise her son. Let that sink in for a moment. However, the mother goes against her better judgment and the family stayed put, much to Lee's relief, because he had no interest in going to live in the islands. Friends described Lee as respectful, quiet, and helpful. A new friend was 16-year-old Matthew Borges. Both were sophomores at Lawrence High School and shared many mutual friends, including Matthew's girlfriend for part of that year, Leilani. Matthew Borges was described as smart too, but friends say underneath he seethed with a quiet rage. Though he and the well-behaved Lee were described as close, Matthew got into a substantial amount of trouble on a regular basis, especially at school. Other friends had already begun to distance themselves from Matthew, alleging bad behavior. He was getting into things that they had no desire to be a part of. Friends said he had a short fuse and was prone to violence. One even claimed he was involved in gang activity. Although Matthew lived at home with both of his parents and four younger siblings, he apparently came from a tough background. Though he was often in trouble at school, he was enrolled in honors classes and was a good student. Classmates described him as a quiet gentleman when in class. They pointed out that he was quick to help and was particularly gifted in physics. At the beginning of 2016, Matthew began dating fellow sophomore Leilani, and the two saw each other nearly every day for nine months. In the evenings and on weekends, they did homework and studied together. They even shared one journal at Matthew's suggestion. 
He thought the journal would be an easy way to share the feelings that were too difficult for them to say out loud. Matthew's first entry was, I love you, and the journal included things like, I can't stop thinking about you. I just want to live with you already. I don't know what I would do if you were gone and left my life. Over the course of that year, as lovers young and old often do, they grew apart, according to Leilani. They no longer had a connection, and the teens broke up on August 31st, 2016. Following their split, Leilani said that Matthew gave her a list of guys' names whom he believed she was having sex with. Lee Valoria Paulino's name was on that list, though she insisted the two were just friends, as the three of them always had been. Per Leilani's recollection, Matthew grew more and more jealous of her friendship with Lee. One day in the cafeteria at school, Matthew had to be escorted out by a dean after seeing Leilani and Lee laughing and losing his temper. She stated that, He yelled at me about being friendly with Lee because we were making jokes with each other and he thought we were flirting. After his breakup with Leilani, Matthew's behavior, according to transcripts of texts and Facebook messages, really began to spiral into darkness. He had begun chatting more and more with a girl named Stephanie. They had begun dating. Stephanie was part of the friend group, so she was familiar with Leilani and Lee too, whom she described as bright sunshine. Stephanie and Matthew had spent months messaging each other online, and it was here that he shared his thoughts with her about his desire to kill. He said he liked the sound of it. Matthew wrote, I'll hide in the back of my mind like always and wait for the day I truly go insane. Another text read, I think of killing someone and I smirk. It's all I think about every day. He spent a lot of time messaging his friends online too, and in October, a plan began to come together for a group of five of them to rob Lee Manuel at his house. Both online and in the journal he had shared with Leilani, Matthew detailed bringing bags to cover their shoes with and how they would need duffel bags to steal things like Lee's PlayStation, video games, clothes, and belts. He mentions wearing clothes they don't care about. That isn't all he shared with them either. Matthew also shared with his friends on the chat that he wanted to kill someone. Guys, he said, I'm going to kill someone on Halloween. I'm not lying. So if you hear someone dead on the news that we know, I just want to say that y'all going to look at me different. By November, his text became more sinister. On the 7th, he told Stephanie, You went and said hi to Lee and not me, right? Didn't even hit me up or let me know you was at school. But Lee and Matthew appear to still be friends. Lee's mother reports that the first time he had ever been to their home was after that text was sent. On November 17th, Matthew texted Stephanie that his eyes will look dead soon. Take a good look at my eyes the next time we talk. People will notice the big difference in me when my eyes turn dead. The next day, Lee's supposed friends put their robbery plan into action. Matthew went to Lee's home and they left. The notes in the journal had read, Go chill with him at his crib alone. The friends head toward the nearby bank of the Merrimack Valley River to smoke marijuana and listen to music and watch the boathouse light up, according to Matthew. His job of luring Lee Manuel away complete, the other four teens moved in and burglarized the home. Footage of the four of them creeping in to rob the victim's home was also captured. Surveillance camera footage shows the pair walking away from the house around 5.40 p.m. As it turns out, November 18, 2016, would be the last day anyone in Lee Manuel's family saw him alive. His grandmother recounted seeing him, like normal, happy and singing after school. He inquired as to her dinner menu, they talked about school and told each other they loved one another. After that, he went upstairs to take a nap, and that was the last time she saw her grandson. 
Lee and his mother, who was in the Dominican Republic at that time, lived in the multi-family home with his grandmother, who was a retired teacher from his high school, along with uncles and a few other relatives. When his uncle returned home on that Friday, November 18th, he saw two of the group of teens robbing the home, although he couldn't tell who they were or what they were doing. But he could see that the door to Lee and his mother's apartment upstairs was open, which was unusual. When he went up to check, he found Lee's bedroom door locked. All he could really see of the teens in the backyard were hoodies up over their heads, similar to how Lee sometimes wore his. The uncle had called out, but the boy had just kept walking. His grandmother did not know of Lee ever having left the home without permission. Once they consulted with Lee's mother in the Dominican Republic, she told them to jimmy the door open, and they do. But Lee Manuel isn't in there. Considering that he's a teenager, the family just assumes that he snuck out with his friends. They have no reason to believe otherwise. So, they set a noisy trap for the teen, and the waiting begins. They piled pots and pans atop a daybed and rolled it underneath the path he would follow to get back in. When they were to hear the ensuing chaos, they planned to catch him in the act. Morning came, but there was no Lee. Full panic began to set in. They called police, they called his friends, and they searched the neighborhood. With still no news on Sunday, Lee's bedroom is thoroughly searched. His cell phone is discovered ringing under his pillow. His keys and wallet are there, too and his friends don't seem to know where he is. All recent numbers are retrieved and the people are contacted, but still no one has any news. On Monday, they go to Lawrence High School, but still nothing. No one seems to have seen Lee since he left his grandmother in the kitchen after dinner on Friday. In the meantime... Lee's family unearthed the security camera footage that would lead police to the curly-haired kid seen walking toward the river with Lee that Friday. When police show Lawrence High's principal a still captured from the video, he tells them it's Matthew Borges. This was November 23rd and marked the first time they questioned Matthew regarding Lee's disappearance on the 18th. They questioned him without his parents present. Matthew tells them about the pair walking down Forest Street toward the river that night, claiming Lee left Matthew there and went home around 7 p.m. They ask him if he killed Lee. He says he didn't. Matthew did take police to where he says Lee left him, along the south side of the shore of the river. Six days later, Lee Detective Hegarty had Matthew come in for further questioning, and this time he brought his father. The detective told Matthew that Lee had now been missing for 11 days and that they were seriously concerned about his safety. Hegarty explained that they didn't care about the fact that the teens were doing drugs. Matthew went over his story again, but this time he said he left Lee there around 7 p.m., not the other way around as he had previously stated. Hegarty asks Matthew if he knows whether Lee Manuel ran away if he was having problems at home, or maybe he was hiding out from some trouble he had gotten into. At that point, Matthew's demeanor changed to irritation, and he said they've already spoken about that. He accused the detective of asking him the same things in different ways. Detective Hegarty all but says he thinks he's lying, but he has no proof. There's no evidence connecting Matthew to Lee Manuel's disappearance. On November 28th, the Michigan State Police arrive at Lawrence Police Department's request. Then just before 3 p.m. on December 1st, a headless corpse was found partially submerged in the Merrimack River. The hands had also been cut off at the forearms. People walking a dog noticed her messing with something in the water. Police found Lee's severed head in a plastic bag bobbing in the water nearby. It had been weighted down with rocks. 